All right, here we are. We're in chapter 3, and we're going to have a real cheery Bible study today. <laughs> we're looking at Laodicea, a church that is not a single believer in it. Not a single believer in Laodicea. So beginning at chapter 3, verse 14, reading to verse 22, Jesus speaking, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so let me begin as I've been uh, by reminding you of some of the basics. I'll give you a background, give you some information, then we'll move into the, the uh, interpretation and application of this particular portion of Scripture. So I've been saying that each of these letters, and you have seven letters, this is the seventh letter, the last letter. You have seven letters, and each one has at least three applications. You have what is called the primary. It has direct bearing on the churches that are represented. It has the personal, each person in the church, each church has people in the church that need to take heed to what the Spirit is saying, and you have the prophetic, and the prophetic element is the, that it outlines seven stages of the life of the church from Pentecost to the rapture. As we've been going through these, these churches, we've looked at Ephesus, the church from Pentecost to A.D. 160. It's a church that's leaving its first love. We looked at Smyrna. The church from 160 to 312, which is the persecuted church. We looked at Pergamos, representing the church from 312 to 600. We called it the compromising church. We looked at Thyatira, the church from 600 to 1500. We referred to it as the church in apostasy. We looked at Sardis, the church from 1500s to 1750s, the church of dead orthodoxy, and Philadelphia. This was the truly regenerated church. It's the faithful church throughout the ages. But today we look at the church of Laodicea. And if you gave Laodicea a name, it would be the lukewarm church. Laodicea is the last. It's the worst of the churches that Jesus is addressing. You see, the downward trend that started with the church leaving its first love has produced Laodicea. Losing your fire for the Lord results in compromise. It can result in apostasy, and it can result in an external kind of religion. You see, when the pastor loses his fire, it results in a church being filled with unbelievers. In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 13, Jesus gave a series of parables. He spoke of the kingdom, and he said, for example, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. He said the seed grew. It became like a tree that, that birds of the air nested in. He spoke of the kingdom of heaven being like leaven. He said that a woman took and hid leaven in dough until all of the dough was leavened. He gave a parable of the wheat and the tares. He said a sower went out to sow good seeds in his field, but while men slept, an enemy sowed tares among the wheat. And when the wheat sprouted, the tares appeared along with the wheat. All of those parables spoke of the church and how it has been infiltrated with unbelievers. You think of the mustard seed. The mustard seed is the smallest seed in Israel. But this mustard seed had a large growth. It grew large. It harbored birds. The birds were a symbol of evil nesting in an unusually large mustard plant. 
In Scripture, we know that leaven is used as a type of sin. And so the picture of the woman that put the yeast or leaven in the dough, well, leaven permeated the dough. Sin permeated the church. And then you have that parable with the wheat and tares growing alongside of one another. And that, once again, speaks of infection. The tares are part of the visible church, but all along they're not genuine. In reality, they're unbelievers who have somehow become comfortable going to church. And that's a picture of the church in the last days. How did that happen? How is it that the church in the last days, in the days we're living in right now, how is it that unbelievers have become comfortable going to church? They did it because a fire of faith went out and it was replaced with acceptable unbelief. Now, we saw that Philadelphia was a church that worshiped the one who is holy and true. Philadelphia knew that Jesus was holy. They knew that he's the truth and that he gave truth. And the result was that Jesus promised to return and save them from the tribulation. But on the other hand, the Laodicean church is a false church filled with unbelievers. It's interesting that Laodicea considers itself strong and wealthy and influential. But Jesus says their self-assessment is completely wrong. In fact, he says you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and you are naked. Laodicea represents the apostate church, a Christ-rejecting church, the churches throughout the ages that call themselves by the name of Christian, but in fact don't worship the Christ. And prophetically, this is today's Christ-rejecting church. Notice that Laodicea coexists with the Philadelphian church during this church age. So as we've studied the churches, we've noted that Jesus has words to each church. And out of the seven churches, all but two, Smyrna and Philadelphia, were rebuked sharply. Five of the churches were departing from God. They were called to repentance. Ephesus, in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Repent. Do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. When he spoke to Pergamos in Revelation 2, 14 through 16, he said, I have a few things against you because you, you, have those, uh, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. When he spoke to Sardis, he said in Revelation 3, 2 and 3, Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. To Thyatira, Revelation 3, 19, he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And to Laodicea, well, Laodicea has become guilty. She's departed from the Lord. This is, again, the lukewarm church. It describes the condition of the church at the end of the church age. The church age is a period of time from Pentecost to the rapture. It's called this because it covers the period of time that the church is on earth. It ends when the church is raptured to be taken with Jesus Christ. So as we look at Laodicea, let me share a little bit about this particular city. The city of Laodicea was founded by Antiochus II around 250 before Christ. It was located 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia on the road to Colossae. The church was in a prosperous city at the intersection of three major highways. It was a very successful financial and commercial center. It was filled with wealthy bankers and financiers. It was known throughout the ancient world for its black wool that was woven into beautiful clothing. It had one serious problem, poor drinking water. Its main water supplies were hot springs, which were filled with impurities. It could be that Jesus was referring to the Laodiceans as lukewarm, being neither hot nor cold, as a reference to these springs. It had a huge stadium, theaters, lavish public baths, and shopping centers. There's no word in Scripture of how it was when the church was planted, but Paul did send greetings to believers who lived in Laodicea. Colossians 4.15, it says, 
salute the brethren in Laodicea. Now, here's something as I was going through this that I found interesting. The word Laodicea is translated rights, rights of the people. And that describes the church in the last days. The people demanded their rights. And as a result of demanding what they wanted, they ignored God's word. They ignored the commands of God. And when you demand your rights and reject the things that God says, the result is a church in a state of anarchy, a church that is morally apathetic, a church that is lukewarm. It's not even really what you would call a church. And how does Jesus feel about this? He, he's very clear. He says this, Laodicea, you make me want to vomit. You make me want to throw up. You see, in today's do what you want, it's all okay world. Such words can be shocking to people that Jesus would actually say that. The thought that Jesus, who is grace incarnate, could say this is rejected by people. And even though they read it or hear it, they still refuse to believe him. The sad thing is they're living in Laodicea and they don't even know it. They're like that proverbial frog in the kettle. You know how you can place a frog in a kettle of cold water and you can place it on, on the fire and the frog will stay there in that, in that kettle of water because the frog doesn't have the capacity to know that the water is heating up and the frog will stay in that water until the water boils the frog to death. And there are a lot of people who are living like that frog in the water, boiling to death as the temperature rises and not even noticing it. And so Jesus is speaking in verse 14, and notice how he begins. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He doesn't identify himself with any of the descriptions that are found in chapter 1. Instead, he gives what is called a threefold description of himself. It's intended to contrast the sovereignty and faithfulness of Christ with the church's unfaithful witness. So he begins by simply saying, these things says the amen. Now, the word amen is a word that speaks of that which is fixed and unchangeable. In, in the Bible, the word amen is often used to emphasize the truthfulness of a statement. Like it says in Psalm 41, 13, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Or Romans eleven thirty six, for of him and through him and to him are all things are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Or 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, Paul says. Amen. So that reveals his sovereignty. His word is final. His will is performed. He is the ultimate authority. He is the amen. He is the final word. And in Jesus, all of God's promises of mercy, grace, hope, and life are fulfilled. He's that amen. He's the one who has guaranteed the fulfillment of all God's promises. So in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, All the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God by us. So in this context, Jesus is God's last word. There is no improving on Jesus Christ. He speaks of himself as the faithful and true witness which refers back to chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 7. What does that mean? Well, it means every promise he makes, he keeps, and every word he says is true. And that stands in contrast to the unfaithful and false witness of the Laodiceans. They think that they're outstanding. They think that they're faith-filled believers. But Jesus says, you are self-deceived. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says it like this. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? Jesus is faithful and true because he is the truth, and he is the true witness. He keeps his word. He fulfills his promises because he's trustworthy. We need to remember that right now. He keeps his word. He fulfills his promises. You can trust him. He's trustworthy. His testimony is consistent with what is true. He can be re relied on because he never lies, and he never shades the truth. You see, Proverbs 14, 5 simply says, a faithful witness does not lie. So he speaks the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And Jesus demonstrated this attribute 
for us. He stands before Pontius Pilate. And as Pilate is trying to judge him, Jesus in John 18, 37 said it like this. He said, for this reason, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Well, that contrasts with the Laodiceans' unfaithful witness. They haven't remained faithful, but Jesus has. He is completely faithful. In John 8, 29, he said it like this. He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I always do those things that please him. He is faithful and he is true. And then third, I'll develop this with you for just a moment because it needs to be developed. He says, I am the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. Now, I begin by saying this doesn't mean that he is the first thing that God created. There are false religious cults that teach that Jesus is God's first creation. This has been a verse that false teachers who attempt to undermine the deity of Jesus Christ has used. They have used this. They've said, see, it says right here, I'm the, I'm the first creation of God. Let me give you a little history. It'll take you a moment. Very early in church history, false teachers began to rise up who denied that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. There was a guy by the name of Arius. Some of you perhaps have heard of Arius. Arius was a priest in Alexandria, Egypt. He lived from 256 to 336. And Arius denied that Jesus was God in the flesh. He taught that Jesus was created by God as the first act of creation and that the nature of Christ was unlike that of God the Father. And he began something that is now referred to in church history as Arianism. Arianism is the view that Jesus is a finite created being with some divine attributes, but he is not eternal and he is not divine in and of himself. He is not God. When that particular heresy invaded the church, a council was called together. There was a man by the name of Athanasius. His nickname is Athanasius against the world because Arius' heresy had infected much of the church world. And so Athanasius stood up and someone said to Athanasius, 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 the world is against you. And he said, it is not the world against Athanasius. It is Athanasius against the world. And so he was called Athanasius against the world. And he stood up and he withstood against, he withstood Arius and the error. The church was beginning to believe that Jesus was a created being. But Athanasius rose in opposition. And they had a council called the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And at the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed, some of you have heard that, you were taught that when you were younger, Nicene Creed was formulated to preserve the Christian faith. And the creed said, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made for us, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. And so that is called the Nicene Creed, where Jesus Christ is begotten, not made. But there are those today who teach that he's God's first creation. And they point to Jesus calling himself the beginning of the creation of God. So what does that mean? Well, beginning is used to say that he began or is the source of all creation. In Revelation 1.8, that verse spoke of Jesus as the beginning and the ending. 
Jesus, in other words, is the one who created all things. And this lines up with Scripture. In John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him, not anything made was made. In Colossians 1, 16 through 18, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. All things were created by him, the scripture says. And so in Hebrews 3, 4, every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. And so Jesus Christ is referring to himself as the beginning, as the originator, not the first to be created. You may not think that's important, but that's a cardinal doctrine I just gave to you. In verse 15, it says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What an appetizing thought. I know you. I know your works, he's saying to this church. You're neither cold nor are you hot. You're lukewarm. When he says, I know you, remember Hebrews 4.13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of, uh, of him with whom we have to do. I know your works. Jesus is aware, he's seen, and they're not commendable. Remember that works reveal your spiritual state. Remember that salvation results from grace and faith, but works confirm or deny true salvation. A person who claims to know the Lord is going to have accompanying works, and that will demonstrate whether or not they really know him. So Jesus knows. Jesus knows their works, he's saying. And notice how he says, I, I could wish you were cold or hot. To wish is to have a great desire. How I wish. It's like what the psalmist said in Psalm 81, 13. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I wish that you would listen to me. I wish that you could be either cold or hot. Cold, co cold coffee is not good, and hot water can be good for a bath, but not to drink. We need to remember that Laodicea was located be between Hierapolis, which was famous for its hot springs, and Colossae, known for its cold, refreshing mountain water. Laodicea had water piped in. It was known for being dirty and unpleasant to drink. Cold is refreshing, hot is useful, but lukewarm induces vomiting. I don't like lukewarm coffee. I don't like lukewarm soda, lukewarm soup or lukewarm tea. I don't like any of that. It's not satisfying. But the church was filled with lukewarm hypocrites, professing to be Christian, but being unsaved. They were Christian in name only. It's like what it says in Matthew 5, uh, 15, 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's like what he said in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are a lot of people today, I've encountered them, who claim to be Christian, who in fact are not, who only say they are, but have no accompanying works that demonstrate that they've been regenerated. Jesus is speaking about that, and he's saying that in the last days, that the churches, there will be churches that are Laodicean, that are filled with unbelievers. So the question has to be asked, how does that happen? How does a church become lukewarm and filled with unbelief? It may be the result of a heritage of poor pastoring. When you read your Bible, 30 years earlier, Paul wrote an exhortation to one of the pastors. It's found in Colossians 4, verses 16 and 17. Now, when this epistle is read among you, See that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord 
that you fulfill it. The church drifted from its biblical moorings and the church lost its fire. The pastor didn't hold fast to Jesus, who is the amen and faithful and true witness. He allowed the church to direct him instead of the spirit directing him. Charles Feinberg, one of the commentators that I use, said, this church boasts of wealth, methods, and organization, but it fails to realize its absence of spiritual life. Jesus informs them they are utterly insensitive to their condition. Prophetically, in these last days, many professing Christians are lukewarm. Jesus gave the warning to the pastor because the pastor leads and sets the tone for the church. And some churches are led by consistently ungodly and carnal pastors. Many of these men lead congregations, and some of them are well known. I was invited many years ago now to a meeting with local pastors. It was years ago, and there was an issue that was called Proposition 8. Some of you might remember it. It was a, an issue that California voters were dealing with at that time, uh, whether or not that homosexual marriage should be legalized. And so many of the pastors were brought to meet with one of our assembly women who wanted to hear from the religious leaders in her community. And so I went to this meeting, and there were quite a number of others who were there. And um, as I was seated there listening, and there were a number of pastors who were voicing opinions, this and that. And I, when I go to meetings, I don't take over. I don't try and run the show. I just listen. I want to see what they're saying. That's what I do. And if I sense that I should say something, then I will. Most of the time, I, I feel very comfortable just listening and, and um, hearing and all, that's what I do until the Spirit says you need to speak. And on this particular occasion, there were, like I said, a number of, of men who were pastoring churches in our area. And one of the men said, I don't see what the big deal is. He said, in the Bible, homosexuality is only mentioned around four times. And I turned, I couldn't stop myself. I turned and I looked at him. And I said, how many times does God have to tell you something until you listen? Because God only has to say it once, guys. He doesn't have to repeat himself. If my father says something once to me, I better listen. That's how it is in my house. That's how it was. When my heavenly father speaks, you better listen. And he doesn't have to say it more than once. And so I told this quote-unquote pastor, how many times does God have to talk to you until you listen? And everybody got all weird and all of that. But you know what? It's true. It's true. When God says it, you better believe it. And the church of Laodicea is a church that is not listening to what the Spirit has to say. Church services today in many places have become carnal gatherings filled with carnal people. The pastors aren't pastoring their sheep. And I'm going to speak as a pastor to you. I hope you don't mind me doing that for a moment. The pastors are not pastoring their sheep. The pastors have become public speakers, but the church is filled with unsaved people. The people attending church focus on what they can get out of it, not worship of God. A friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, was mentioning that a church in his town has what they call whiskey nights, where they come and they drink their whiskey. That's, in, that's to encourage people to invite their neighbors to come to church. He told me of a church that has small groups that watch videos in the small group and end up drinking wine after they watch the video. And he said they're getting drunk. In a ministry seminar, one children's minister said that ministry stresses him out so much that when he gets home, he unwinds with a couple of glasses of wine. One very well-known pastor was just removed from his church for moral failure. Pastors who are like me are told not to judge others, to accept people as they are. But the fact is, Spiritual leaders are held to a higher standard. We are judged more strictly. In James 3, verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And a pastor who doesn't tell you the truth should get out of the pulpit. He shouldn't pollute the minds of the people with false teaching. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. That's not, that's not harsh judgment. That's what Jesus said. 
He said, judge with a spiritual discernment. They were supposed to live according to the word of God. That's not legalism. That's liberty in Christ. That's a freedom God gives to us. And, and that's how you live. You want your life to be blessed? Listen to what God has to say. You want to be blessed? Follow what he has to say. And if you don't want to, then don't call yourself a Christian because you're not. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Now, that's Christianity. We need to understand that. And we need, to, we need more pastors who, who are not afraid of the people. We need pastors who are afraid of Jesus Christ. The fear of God is what drives out the ignorance of spiritual things. And we need to be that way. And I'm speaking to myself, guys. I want to be a man who finishes well. I want to be a man who teaches you the word of God. I don't want a church of Laodicea. I want people who are the church of Philadelphia, who love Jesus Christ and are waiting for his return. That's what we're supposed to be. Not a Laodicean church. He says, this is a church that's not faithful. It's not a true witness. Churches that are not faithful and true attract and develop others who are the same way. They, they preach a message that people want to hear, but it doesn't develop them spiritually. In Jeremiah 5.31, it said, the prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power. My people love to have it so. The interesting thing is, when asked if the church is solid, the answer was yes. He says in verse 17, you see, I'm rich, wealthy, have need of nothing. That was their self-evaluation. The church had a self-estimate of greatness. For them, success is de determined by statistics regarding membership and attendance of giving, staff, facilities, activities, being well-known but not faithful to God. The Laodiceans are carnal and lukewarm. They're caught up with a reputation for success. On the church self-esteem scale, they are top-notch. They have it all. They are proud of their church, and they're proud of themselves. But Jesus in verse 17 says, my evaluation is you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, often these are the hardest to reach because they think they're fine just as they are. But Jesus speaks to him in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous, repent, is what he says to them. Buy from me the things that are real, the things that are genuine, that demonstrate redemption. He says, buy gold that is refined. When he says, buy gold that is refined, this represents riches of true salvation. In 1 Peter 1, 7, Peter spoke of faith that is more precious than gold. He speaks of white garments that you may be clothed. That speaks of righteousness. In Revelation 19, 8, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. He says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Your eyes need to be healed. You need to see clearly. Laodicea had expensive powder for eyes, and they were proud of it. So he says, you need eyes that see what I'm doing. In Psalm 146, verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. And then he goes on to say something in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. This has what is called a twofold application. One, I want you to notice this. Jesus is waiting for an invitation to be Lord of the individual as well as Lord over the church. It seems obvious there are no true Christians in this church. If only one opened his heart to Christ, Jesus would enter into the church. But second, he's saying, I'm bringing judgment. In Luke 12, 35 through 40, listen to what it says. Be dressed, ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. 
like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. A lot of times we speak and we use this scripture, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door. Uh, I will come into him, sup with him, and he with me. That's a scripture that you hear very often in uh, in crusades and invitations. And we like to picture Jesus at the door knocking. But the application, the actual um, context of that passage is it can be applied to let's welcome the Lord, but it's really a warning to a church that locked the doors to him. The church didn't want Jesus inside of it. The church is supposed to be hungry for the word of God. The church, true believers, say that they long for the word of God more than their necessary food. We're supposed to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby like newborn babies do. We're supposed to see that the value of relationship with Jesus is greater than the value of anything else. But the Laodicean church, because it was popular, because it was apparently well-known, as a large church and, and considered themselves to be just on, on top of things, had taken the standards of the world and used them to have a, a self-estimate of greatness. When Jesus is saying, you locked me out of the doors. You, you may have the name Jesus somewhere on the door or on the title of the church for that matter, he's saying, but you haven't welcomed me in. It would seem that the pastor, for fear of offending sensitive hearers, had watered down things to the point where it became a social club of unbelievers. When you got them all together, they would speak concerning how great they were. But Jesus said, it's not the way you see yourself, it's how I see you. And I see you as being filled with unbelievers. So I speak first to the messenger, to the pastor. And I'm saying to him, you need to remember who I am. And you need to remember what I've said. And this is what is to be given to the church. There are many places, and some of you know this. Some may not believe this. But there are many places where if a Bible study is given, you'll empty the church. I had a lady write me a letter saying if I could pray for her church because she said, my pastor decided to teach us through the gospel of Mark. And they fired him because he's teaching the Bible. She said, would you pray for my church and my ex-pastor because he wanted to simply teach the word of God. Many years ago, I had a young woman who contacted me and wanted to have some counsel. I was sharing this recently. I hope it wasn't with first service. I don't like to repeat myself too much. But she said, she called a church. This was when I was an assisting pastor. And she said, can I meet with one of the men there? And so I met with her on, after a Sunday morning. She was supposed to bring her boyfriend. And now it's just this young, young woman there sitting with me, speaking to me. And as we were speaking, I said, I thought your boyfriend was supposed to be with you. I thought you were having uh, relationship problems and wanted to talk. And she said, he didn't want to come. I said, where is he? Oh, he's playing some football with his friends right now. I said, so he's playing football while you're sitting in here. She said, yes. I said, what can we speak about? And she starts to share. And as she shares, she begins to tell me that 
she and he were having uh, physical relations and all. And I said, well, you realize, of course, uh, well, and secondly, I said, is your boyfriend, is he a professing Christian? She says, no. I said, okay, let's begin with that. One, the scripture says you are not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Are you a believer in Christ? She says, yes. I said, is he? She said, no. I said, there's your first mistake. Second, the Bible teaches us that we're not to fornicate. Do you know what fornication is? She says, I don't think I do. So I shared it's, it's what the scripture calls unlawful sexual intercourse with someone who is not your husband. I said, you're involved in sexual sin. You're with an unbeliever. You're involved in sexual sin. I said, have you ever heard this before? And she says, no. I said, you go to church? And she says, yes. I said, at your church, has your pastor ever taught you that before? And she says, I've never heard this. How long have you been in the church? She says, I basically grew up in it. So you've grown up in a church where your pastor has never taught you the word. And she says, yes. I said, listen, honey, this is what God's word says. This is what you should do. If your boyfriend really cared about you, he'd be here right now. But he cares more about his friends in football than he does for you. Do you think he may be telling you something about your relationship? She says, I think he is. I said, then you know what to do. You need to turn away from your sin. You need to not be with this guy. And you need to follow Jesus Christ. And I prayed with her and left it at that. A short while later, within a year or two, I planted this church. And as I was planting this church, within a year of the, of the existence of this church, I got a letter. And it was a letter from this girl. I still remember what she said. She says, you may not remember me, but I was that young girl crying in your office who had a boyfriend who had, had been, and she explained her situation. She says, I never saw you again. Let me share with you what happened. She says, I broke up with him. I got right with Jesus Christ. I went to college to become a nurse. I became the president of the Christian club. I met a great Christian young man. He asked me to marry him, and I'm asking you to come to my wedding because I'm that girl who's been transformed by, by what Jesus Christ can do in somebody's life. And that's why you preach the gospel. That's why. So that people's lives are changed. I could have said, oh, don't worry about it. Here, do this, do this, do this. It's fine. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And I have to tell you, there's more than one church that doesn't teach the word of God. Even this morning, even in this city, even in this city, there's more than one church that doesn't teach the word of God. And Jesus said, you may think you're fine, but you're not. You're naked. You're miserable. You're wretched. You've locked me out of the church. He says, open the door. I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open up and have a believer there, I can do something amongst you. The church of Laodicea, the church of the last day. To him who overcomes, he says, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All true Christians will share in the authority that Jesus exercises, for we will reign with him. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 12, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he also will deny us. And he says, if you have an ear, listen to what the Spirit is saying. And that goes for us, too. If you have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says. We do not want to be the church of Laodicea. We want to be the church of Philadelphia, where Jesus says, I will save you from the tribulation. I will come receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So we hear what he says, and we obey. That's what the church does. And that's what we're to do. Amen. That's what we're to do.